beginning of verse 1, Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 1. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as, palm, as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O King of nations? For to thee doth it appertain. For as much as among all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish, and gold from Euphaz, the work of the workmen, and of the hands of the founder. Blue and purple is their clothing. They are all the work of cunning men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting King. At his wrath the earth shall tremble, and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. Thus shall ye say unto them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When he uttered his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Every man is brutish in his knowledge, every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten image is falsehood, there is no breath in them. They are vanity and the work of errors. In the time of their visitation they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things. And Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Gather up thy wares out of the land, O inhabitant of the fortress. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will sling out the inhabitants of the land at this once, and will distress them, that they may find it so. Woe is me for my hurt. My wound is grievous. But I said, Truly, this is a grief, and I must bear it. My tabernacle is spoiled, and all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me, and they are not. There is none to stretch forth my tent any more, and to set up my curtains. For the pastors are become brutish, and have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. Behold, the noise of the brute is come, and a great commotion out of the north country, to make the cities of Judah desolate, and a den of dragons. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob, and devoured him, and consumed him, and have made his habitation desolate. All right, I'm talking today about uh, Christmas fully persuaded. Christmas fully persuaded. <clears throat> Two things in regard to the area of Christmas and the celebration that happens this time of year um, that I want to point out specifically is one that I believe this is an area of self-persuasion, rather an area of preference to the believer. Also, the second point I want to make is that the arguments against Christmas are not strong arguments, and nor are they biblical in my opinion, okay? So I just want to put those two thoughts out there. Again, the first is going to be the main point, because it's an area of preference. So as I go into point two and start to make my arguments uh, counteracting the idea of Christmas, you need to understand that, that this is my opinion, this is my preference, this is how my family practices, and this is not an area that Christians need to fight and bicker about. Though every year the contention rises when people start to bicker and fight about all these things. Uh, turn with me to Romans chapter 14. <clears throat> Romans chapter 14. Okay, first, 
Christmas and the celebration thereof is an area of self-persuasion or preference. In Romans chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. So here it's talking about weak believers and strong believers. Typically, that's one that has been a believer longer compared to one that's been shorter. Though I've seen it the other way, where somebody can be a believer for many years and yet not grow past the area of infancy. And then somebody gets saved, they're in their Bible two, three, four times right away, and they grow exponentially. Weakness is ne not necessarily dependent on time since your salvation, but more, I think more commonly that's what it is. So it's talking about the one that is weaker, the newer believer, if you will, or the unlearned believer to be received in this context, but not received in order to have doubtful disputations, in order to doubt what they believe and to dispute with them and to argue with them. They're just to be received, even as the Bible says, God hath received him there at the end of verse 3. So here, it's explaining there that, that one is actually right in this case, okay? And it highlights that when it says in verse 3, um, or verse 2, for one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Okay, so it's talking about the weaker one that's eating herbs. This is in the area of I'm going to eat all things or I'm going to be a vegetarian, right? The Bible says, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And the contrawise is also true. For why? Verse 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. Even the weak is able to stand because he is trusting in the same Lord. God hath received him, the Bible says. The stronger believer should receive him in the same way. <clears throat> This is not a point of, dis of a dispute, and not a point of argument or judgment regarding being a vegetarian or eating whatever you feel like. And in Japan, I ate whatever I felt like. So I guess I would be in the, in the first category, the one who thinks he can eat all things. But regardless, if someone was in here and they were a vegetarian, hey, they're free to do that. I'm not going to judge them for that. They can make that choice. And they shouldn't do the same to me because I'm eating shark fans and oysters and, and horse and just everything that, that, that they would throw at me, right? <clears throat> Continue on into verse 5. It says, One man esteemeth one day above another. So here we're now talking about days being lifted up versus not. I lift this day up. I'm esteeming one day above another day. In other words, I've set this one to be pinnacle or more important than another. The Bible says, Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And there's, there's the catch. You need to be persuaded of these things. If you've decided to eat all things, be persuaded, biblically. If you've decided you should eat herbs, be persuaded, biblically. If you decided that you're going to lift up one day, esteem one day greater than another, be persuaded according to what the Bible says. And the same thing's true if you're just like blanket, they're all the same. There's no different. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, January through December. It's all the same to me. Be persuaded biblically. Let the Bible speak to you and let you be persuaded in your own mind based on your understanding of the scriptures and the God that leads you through them. Continuing on in verse 5, it says, Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth, verse 6, the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. This is saying that both have before God a clear conscience, both are eating or not eating, both are regarding the day or not regarding the day, and both have chosen to give God thanks, whatever their decision was. So they are standing with a clear conscience before God, and therefore this is not something, like I said, that one group should judge the other upon, because both are standing before their own master as a servant with a clear conscience at this time. Verse 7 talks about our position before this God. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. 
For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or we die, we are the Lord's. We belong to God. We are his possession. We are his servant. We are under his headship, under his, his mastership, essentially. So, therefore, we're not living to ourselves, but unto God. And if we're always living unto ourselves, instead, or living to ourselves, you can see why there would be area of dispute. But what's being talked about here in chapter 14 of Romans is two men that are living to God. Living unto God. Whether I live or I die, I am to God word, okay? So these are two men uh, that have not a conflict. They're not, they're not uh, you know countering scriptures they're not being contentious against scriptures or one another they're both rather in their position before their god judged according to this thing that's what the bible says in verse 9 it says for the to this end christ both died and rose and revived that we that he might be lord both of the dead and the living but why dost thou judge thy brother or why dost thou set thy at not thy brother for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 11, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So if we're talking about two believers with a clear conscience before God, serving him as master, them the servants, why are these two servants bickering one to another and fighting against things that are of no scriptural consequence? One is fully persuaded, the other is fully persuaded, and God is signaling here that in the end, they're both going to be judged according to the decision that they made. So why do they fight about it now? Why are they trying to persuade one another now? Well, we always know the case of that is, is pride. Only by pride cometh contention. So if we're fighting about eating meat or not eating meat, or if we're fighting about lifting up one day or not lifting up another, it's because there's pride in the situation. That's why there's contention between you and I as believers. <clears throat> The Bible records very clearly that every one of us shall give account to himself, and that should give us comfort, because if I'm standing right before God, hey, I'll be judged, and God will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, for esteeming the day above. And if the other is in the same case, standing before God with a clean conscience, he'll say, hey, this is why I've done these things. God will judge him, and he'll say, hey, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't actually believe that God's going to take these areas that aren't of any kind of consequence scripturally, and he's going to say, no, you were right or you were wrong. We are all given the, the authority to make those decisions in our own life as we walk through this world. And one in particular that I'm bringing up is the idea of one day being esteemed above another. So this is with any holiday, any kind of celebration that a family should choose. Now we know that in Canada, if you open up those calendars that you just got today, there's going to be a whole list of set forth holidays that Canadians follow. Okay? Now we can choose within our household to abide by those and to follow those. Sometimes I don't even have a choice because those are the ones that my work gives me off. Whether I choose to uh, acknowledge what that day is and use that for my, it doesn't matter. I've been given a rest that day, so I can sit at home and twiddle my thumbs not observing it, or I can observe the holiday. It's, it's of no consequence. It's my decision to make. In the same way, Christians can set up one day or not set up another day, or they can just blanket, hey, everything's going to be the same, and that's their decision to make. And I believe, with regard to some of the holidays, that there is good and redeemable aspects to them. I like the fact that Easter highlights the fact that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. It all coincides with different... Um, Passover related timings and, and, and appropriately people celebrate different aspects of it. I understand that it's very Catholicized. I understand that, that they've commercialized. All of these things have happened to the holiday as a whole. But if you just focus on, on what I am going to, as a leader over my family, highlight on that day, which I get off thanks to my, my work and thanks to the country that I live in, then I can choose on that day to just focus on the fact that Jesus died for me, shed his precious blood, and rose again on that Easter Sunday. Glory to God. Wonderful. That's a good thing, in my opinion, to celebrate. If you don't want to, I'm not going to judge you. But you also shouldn't judge me for the same. So... I'm going to bring up now the idea of Christmas, okay? And, and I'm not just picking on, on, on this kind of mentality because when I was saved, I held the view that I'm about to contradict. I had to change in this area. I had to learn and grow in this area. I think I watched too much YouTube when I first got saved, and I learned all sorts of weird things, and I just grabbed a hold of them. It caused a lot of friction in our family. There was a lot of things that that were bad out of it, but I have learned and I've grown in this area, and now where I stand today, I believe is the biblical 
position, okay? I am fully persuaded of that. If, if you want to agree differently, that's fine. But I'm telling you my journey, and hopefully you can learn something along the way, and we can all grow in this area. So this, the first point, again, was that I believe that this is, as it says in Romans 14, talking about days being elevated or not, an area of self-persuasion or a preference. You've got to be fully persuaded in your own mind. The second point that I want to bring up is that I believe that the arguments against Christmas, the ones that I used to hold to, are not very strong arguments. And I, I, in fact, I believe they're not very strong biblically, that you could just... You can just nail it down and say, yeah, we shouldn't do those things. I just want to walk through a few of them that I had believed before and now I believe differently about. <clears throat> the first is that we shouldn't celebrate Christmas because it is driven by commercialism. It is driven by that commercial uh, spirit to just buy and buy and buy and buy and buy. It's completely, you know, it's all about the advertisements. It's all about the next big thing. It's all about selling you stuff that you don't need to try to promote that idea of being, being commercially up here when maybe financially you're way down here. Spending out of your means, even going into debt at that time. So, but I could bring up that most of the world is actually in that same mentality. I mean, it doesn't matter that it's the 25th of December. We just passed Black Friday, and I saw videos of people, like, tearing each other apart, rending each other to get a television per half off. Are you kidding me? That's Black Friday, and that's more closely associated with the holiday of, holiday of Thanksgiving. We sit down, the Americans do anyways, they sit down on the Thursday, and they're like, Lord, we're so thankful for all we have. And then the next day, they're punching people to get more. <laughs> Doesn't that seem contrary to me? It absolutely does. But that's that commercial spirit, and I can see why having that associated with Christmas would give it a negative connotation. But again, that's just the world at large. But we have the decision made. We don't have to act that way. We don't have to have our Christmas be all about spending, buying, going out and fighting for the, the uh, what was the big one, the Cabbage Patch doll. Some of you remember when people were destroying each other for that. The Tickle Me Elmo, that was the one, the one year when everybody needed to have it. I don't know what it is now with the big toy that, that purposely, I, I believe it's purposely, the, the factories put out, you know, this much supply for this much demand just so they can watch people destroy one another for them. Right? <clears throat> but that's not what Christmas needs to be about. And that's what, what it's about for me. It's, it's more important to me to focus on Christ and yes, give gifts, because what was the greatest gift we ever received was, was you know, Jesus Christ, yes, dying on the cross, offering salvation for sure. None of that would have happened were it not for Christ first coming to this earth. So God gave his son in that moment when he was born in from the Virgin Mary, right? That's the thing that we focus on. That's what we celebrate. Obviously, conception happened nine months before that. We have the story of, of John the Baptist and Jesus jumping in the womb when they see one another, and all those are great things, but it all came to, to head at the point when he was born into this world, and so that's what we celebrate. With regard to gifts, we still give gifts as a way of celebrating and being thankful for what we have as a symbol of, you know, what the great gift that Christ gave, but it doesn't have to be the, the big expensive thing. We've actually turned and, and more likely, we're more likely to get meaningful, inexpensive gifts, something that we actually think about what somebody would want. And more often than not, since we've made that turn, we've actually had people that, that have told us that they appreciate it much more when it's just, just some cheap little rinkety-dink thing that actually means something to somebody as opposed to the big gift. I still remember the first time I got my own job and I went out and I spent like most of my paycheck on this thing. And uh, it, did, it, it did, honestly didn't seem to, to go over that well. I, I spent a lot of money on people, but the gifts weren't meaningful. It was just kind of me throwing money at everything. And uh, it didn't mean anything to me. It didn't mean anything to them. And in the end, it gave me a bitter taste in my mouth about Christmas as a whole. This is probably what led me into the, you know, uh, all right, Christianity, I can boycott Christmas. Great, right? But, but no, I've changed on that because, because the focus has changed in my heart. The next argument against celebrating Christmas is that Christmas is mentioned nowhere in the Bible. And I'll bring up that same illustration that I've done before. Well, neither is neither are, are porcelain toilets and toothpaste, okay? There are a lot of good things that aren't mentioned in the Bible. The Bible isn't, isn't just an emporium of every topic that we could possibly need to know about, though it gives us insights into certain things. There are lots of things that are not mentioned in the Bible, but they are great things nonetheless. 
I don't believe that just saying, hey, because it's not mentioned, we shouldn't do it, right? Because, again, there's a plethora of things that aren't mentioned in the Bible, and we can't just use the fact that it's not in here to say, well, then that's sinful because it's not in the Bible. There's a lot of things that aren't in the Bible, a lot of things. I mean, even shoes with zippers on them. I like my shoes with zippers on them. It's not in the Bible. So should I just get rid of them because they're sinful? No, right? Tithes, not in the Bible. Okay, i got to get rid of the tithe because it's sinful. The next thing you know, how far are we going down this trail? Another thing that is not mentioned in the Bible, you know, is, is something like the Internet, which can do all sorts of good and can do all sorts of trouble. It's, it's not distinguished by by whether the Bible says it's sinful or not, it's by what you use the certain thing for. So again, I don't believe that to be a strong argument, though I hear it all the time. It's not mentioned in the Bible, we don't celebrate it. Okay, fair enough. For, uh, the next point, Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. Jesus was not born on December 25th, so how dare you celebrate his birthday on December 25th? Rather, they'll say, okay, that's when Mithra, the sun god, was born. Again, that's me too. I did this, you know, 10 years ago, 9 years ago almost. This was me saying, you know, that I'm not, it's Jesus is the son of God, not the sun god, and here we are on December 25th, celebrating the birth of the sun god. No, well, if you go with me to Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, the main reason that I gave and that I've heard as to why Jesus couldn't be born on December 25th is in Luke chapter 2 and in verse 8. Luke chapter 2 and verse 8. Luke 2 and verse 8, and it says, And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Okay, so here are shepherds in a field at night. No, no shepherd in their right mind would ever have their flock out in the dead of winter at night. Are you kidding me? They'd freeze to death, okay? Wow, that makes sense. Wow, I believe that. Until I did a little bit of research, you know. Israel is not like Canada in December. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> but Jerusalem, in the area that, that encompasses where Jesus Christ was born and where these shepherds were, if you come across in that degree of the same degree of uh, longitude, you get to about the border where Mississippi meets um, uh, Atlanta, sorry, Florida, right, right around the top of Florida, basically there, and Mississippi, that border there. Okay, so those are the southern states, right, in our framework. That's, what, that's about where the sun's going to be abiding at that time of year. And though they'll say that statement, no one in their right mind would abide outside with their flock in the dead of winter when the weather's that, that way. The reality is that the average temperatures there in Israel, as we know with our context of Florida, is actually a high of around 14 degrees Celsius and a low of 8 degrees Celsius. So, I mean, that, that to us, I mean, that's just put on a sweater. I mean, that, that's, that's nothing. That, that's relatively warm. So there's no reason why these shepherds couldn't be out watching their flocks by night. And, and those, those, those sheep have these great big woolly coats. They would probably like the cooler weather. Some of us get the same way, where we prefer once the weather changes and gets a little bit cooler, right? Mm -hmm. So that's also not a great argument to just say, oh, it's, it, it couldn't possibly have been December 25th because the shepherds were out at night. That, car, that cold argument now, see, at that time, seemed like a great argument, but now actually looking into it, it's amazing. It, it doesn't seem to stand up so well. The 25th of December may or may not be the day, okay? But does... Does that really matter? Does it affect what we're doing, what we're trying to celebrate? Again, we've grabbed a hold of a holiday, they'll say, and then we've taken all of these pagan ideas, we're just going to jump on board with it. No, I'm given that time off based on where I live in Canada. I don't really have a choice to say, you know what? I believe that Jesus was born late summer, early fall, and that's when I'm going to take my Christmas holiday. I'm just not at liberty to do that at my workplace. I have the 25th. That's what uh, traditionally and culturally we've used to celebrate as Christ's birth date or the approximate time and that's what I mean we got to stick with it there's really no just over the top yeah that's absolutely why it couldn't have been the 25th argument in scripture that would make me believe elsewise 
<clears throat> the next one is if you were to look in Luke chapter 2 again, we're still there, in verse 1 it says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Okay? And so this is the argument too, that again, because it's so cold and frigid, you know, it's getting down to 14 degrees in the day and it's 8 degrees at night, you know. Because it's so cold, why would the Caesar tax that time of year and take the census? Because it would just be counteractive. A lot of people would just stay home because they're bundled up and they're, they're so cold and they're having a hard time getting out there. But, and this is why they'll say, oh, Jesus must have been then in the summer, early fall. But here, picture this, okay? If you were going on a long journey, you've got, you've got mules and donkeys and you're carrying everything with you on a trailer. You've got your family there. Most of the time you're walking because you're leading the, the, the beast, right? Your, your wife's pregnant in there in the back. You're, you're trying to get down to do this census. Would you prefer to travel, okay, when the weather was what it is, December timing, 14 degrees high or 8 degrees low? Would you prefer to do that travel, great physical activity then? Or where the scholars believe, the late summer, early fall, when the weather is 29 degrees average and 19 degrees is the low? I mean, it actually seems more reasonable that once the weather cooled off in the climate that they lived in, that would be more suited to taking such a, a great journey like that. That would be more suited to doing something like that. Man, people would, would, would just die in weather like 29 degrees on average, 35, you know, 36 when it got up to that. That's not the type of weather that you want to be traveling. That's not the type of weather where you like to get out and do a lot of physical activity. It's a lot better when it's a little bit cooler. So again, I just believe that argument doesn't make sense. Verse, uh, the next one, uh, the fourth, Christmas is pagan, outright pagan. Think of the, the flying reindeer, the jolly fat guy giving gifts for all your good works that you've done, those Yule logs, those mistletoe, you're bringing and decorating, uh, you're decorating an evergreen tree and all these things. That's just pagan to the core, pagan to the core. Go to Jeremiah chapter 10. We started off there. And this is the main passage that they'll use to point out that it's pagan, okay? First thing I'll say is that we personally don't include all of the, the pagan ritualistic things. We don't have Santa Claus. We don't have, you know, we don't have the, the flying reindeer and all these things. It's not about your good works that you're getting gift. A gift is a gift, costs nothing, is, is completely free of charge. You do nothing to receive it. That's what we believe, right? We don't have the Yule log and all the other things that they'll say, well, those are just completely pagan. And then we have that tree inside. And everyone will say, well, there it is. There's your, there's your pagan God there in your living room, okay? The Bible says in Jeremiah 10 and verse 2, it says, Learn not the way of the heathen. I agree with this. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. It says in verse 3, The customs of the people are vain. For, here it is, one cutteth a tree out of the forest, and the work of the hands of the workman with an axe. So he's working with his hands to knock that tree down. He's cutting down that tree. And then look at this, and the verbiage is right there. They deck it with silver and gold. You know, deck the halls with boughs of all. There it is. They're decking it all with silver and gold. After they knocked that tree down, they're fastening it with nails and a hammer that it moved not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. The Bible here is saying that, hey, they're making an idol. I mean, this isn't just a Christmas tree that they brought in. And this is the thing that most people will miss. They'll see that word deck with gold and silver. Oh, no. It, it's a tree that they've axed down. There's cutting a tree out of the forest. But it continues there, and it says it's the work of men's hands. A tree isn't the work of any man's hands. Lobbing it down, yeah, that is work. But what is put into it afterwards, and if you read the context of Jeremiah as a whole, and even just the next verse, it says that they speak not. They must needs be born. It's giving them personage. It's giving them um, mouths. It's giving them, uh, uh, you know, they have legs, but they can't walk. And this is what you find out in all the prophets. They're constantly talking about these idols, these graven images. This is not just a tree that was cut down and brought into the house and then decking the halls with silver and holly. Fa -la 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 -la. That's not what's happening here. He's bringing it in, he's making an idol out of it, and they're worshiping this thing. They're carrying it about. This is why Jeremiah had to bring in the contrary. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? And he continues to just say, the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the everlasting king, because he's highlighting the contrast here. You have the God, the one true God, and then you have all these gods that they're creating when they lob a tree 
everything down, bring it in, work it with their hands to the point where it could have a mouth that doesn't speak. This is what's being discussed here. Men are just simply making idols. This is not somebody bringing a tree into their living room. In fact, you will find that trees are used to garnish and to decorate the inside of the temple at the command of God. It's not a pagan thing to bring plants into your house. It's not pagan to bring in a tree and have it in your house for a time. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't believe so. We bring that tree in, and, and true to how our parents did it, and true to the traditions that we've made, it's a lot of fun to hang goofy things on it and just make it bright, and it's there in your living room, and that's just kind of a festive thing that we just enjoy to have in our living room. I don't see anything wrong with it, and I definitely don't see Jeremiah 10 as a stern rebuke to not take, care, take such customs upon your family. Uh, verse f uh, the next one, the fifth one, is that it's a vain worship. It says, learn not the way of the heathen. And, and, and the reality is, is I don't consider this a vain worship. If I didn't have Christmas, and at a time I was kicking against it and fighting at it, I actually found that there was less worship this time of year and more just like grumpy fighting with people. <laughs> Now, there's much more worship in our house, believe it or not. We open up the Bible to Luke chapter 2, and we read the Christmas story. We open it up to Matthew, and we read the Christmas story as a family. If you, I don't know if you've noticed, but some of those passages are very much ignored throughout the year. Why? Because we reserve those for this time of year when we use those passages to highlight the birth time of Christ. Whether it happened now or not, this is what we've chosen culturally to do. And a good thing about this is it does bring more worship into our house. It also gives the people that are out there more of a mind towards the things of God. Believe it or not, everyone is thinking about Christmas this time of year. And it's Christ centered. And if it's Christ centered, then we have a better opportunity to get the gospel to people that have warmer hearts. Think about it when we went caroling last year, those of us that were here to experience that. In a couple weeks, we'll experience it again. Most of the time when we go knocking in this area, ah, none of you, get out of here. I don't want to talk to you. People don't want to hear us knocking the door preaching Jesus. But if we stand at that same door and sing about Christ being born, Christ our Savior, the blood of Christ, and we just elevate Christ, they'll stand there and they'll listen to us sing and, and, and praise God right at their doorstep. Isn't that amazing? Because people are more soft to the gospel this time of year because of where we are culturally as a country. We should probably try to hold on to a little bit of those things because next thing you know, and Christians somewhere are going to rejoice over this, they're just going to outlaw Christmas altogether and just say you can't even celebrate that thing, right? Because it has Christ in it. They'll call it Xmas and it'll become another satanic worship holiday like Halloween or something. No, we might as well use the advantage that we have that people are thinking about Christ. They're thinking about eternity. They're thinking about Jesus, the, the, the Son of God being born at this time. And we can bring that to their doorstep and we can try to reach them with it. It's just like, it's just like going to talk to somebody right after they've lost a loved one or after they, they're, they're getting sick, right? These are the opportunities that a Christian should take advantage of and not just always shun them, not just always push them away. Oh, I'm not going to that funeral because it's at like a Catholic church or something. Hey, go to the funeral. Don't take part in any of the nonsense, but try to reach people while you're there. Oh, I'm not taking part in, in Christmas because it's Catholic and it's garbage. No, go to the event. Try to reach people while you're there. And, and that's what I'm persuaded is the best thing to do with this time of year. And that's what people will say. They'll say, hey, you can't put Christ back into something that he was never a part of. You can't put Christ into Christmas because he was never there. Uh, Romans chapter 7, if you want to turn there. Uh, no, go to Galatians chapter 2. And while you turn to Galatians chapter 2, I will read from Romans chapter 7. You can't put Christ back into something he was never in. The Bible says in Romans chapter 7, verse 9, verse 9 I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now notice what's happening here. Is Paul was alive. You know what that means? He was alive when he was immediately born. He, he wasn't doomed to hell. He wasn't dead. He wasn't needing a quickening. He was alive at one point. In other words, were he to die in his infancy, he would have been in heaven. Christ was with him. Christ was in him. He would have been saved, right? Then it says, when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. So Paul was alive, then he died, and what is he now? Born again by the Spirit of God, he's alive again. So there, that contradicts your idea that Christ can't be a part of something that he was never in the first place. 
Christ was in, Christ was out, Christ was in, right? That's the birth that people come to when they, when they get to the point as an infant that they now understand the scriptures and then law enters in and then finally they know in their conscience that they're a sinner, they die, and at that point it becomes a need for redemption from Jesus Christ. If you were to go to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So the reality is, is to the Christian, Christ lives in us. So you can't have this argument that says, hey, Christ was never a part of Christmas. If you are saved and you're taking a part in those sort of things, Christ is in you. And the Bible records that whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And when you do it from the position that you're understanding that Christ lives in you and the life that you're living, you're living by the faith of the Son of God. It brings us back to the, uh, the beginning of this whole discussion when we see that there was people that had a clean conscience before God doing one day above another, elevating one day above another, and they're both believers with Christ living in them. So Christ is living in that person even as they're celebrating Christmas, even as they've elevated that day. There's no contradiction. There's no problem biblically with that line of reasoning. The next is that the Bible clearly says, this is why you should not celebrate Christmas, right? The Bible clearly says that we're to celebrate his death and not his birth. We're to celebrate Christ's death and not his birth. Now go back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That'll be just a few pages to the left. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 24. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do in remembrance. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often, verse 26, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Okay? So it's saying, yes, celebrate and, and think upon and meditate upon and bring up into remembrance Christ's death as often as ye take the Lord's Supper in this case. So yes, the Bible does lift up and say that we are to partake, we are to celebrate, we are to recognize Christ's death. But what you see here is there's no contradiction where it says, but don't celebrate any other aspect. It doesn't just, it doesn't just say that this is the only way that we can ever remember Christ. It goes to back to that exclusivity argument where oh, the Bible doesn't say anything about celebrating Christ's birth. It doesn't say anything about celebrating Christ's Christ's miracles. It doesn't say anything about celebrating and remembering and thinking upon Christ's teachings. The Bible doesn't say anything about memori or about remembering and, and calling to remembrance and meditating upon Christ's sermons. It doesn't talk about having a day set aside to think about Christ's love. And you can see how we can get that idea that just, hey, well, if it doesn't say this, we should be solving that, then we can just blanket say we shouldn't be doing anything in this regard. But no, I believe it would be okay and appropriate if a family said, hey, we're going to set up a day in June where we're going to call it Sermon Day, and we're just going to meditate upon and rejoice in and celebrate all of Jesus' sermons. Dad's going to book all those days off from here until the Lord comes, and that's going to be our day of remembrance for Jesus' sermons. There'd be nothing wrong with that. They've esteemed one day above another. And then yet we take that and we say, hey, well, then you can't celebrate or lift up a day there to celebrate Jesus' birth because it's not mentioned in the Bible. Then, then, again, there's just a plethora of things that Jesus did that we should be celebrating. We should be rejoicing in. We should be lifting up. We should be elevating and esteeming. And, and, and I guess we just can't do any of that because it's only his death that we need to celebrate. What about his resurrection? Should we celebrate that too? I believe, yeah, we should. That's probably the best thing that we should be, we celebrate, and that's what we do at Easter. But, you know, some will say we're not even allowed to do that. 
No, we should be celebrating all aspects of the Lord. We should be Amen. giving time to meditate on all things of the Lord. I would to God that every family here would just exactly what I said. Hey, let's have a day. We're just going to call it Love Day. We're going to give gifts in our family, and we're just going to talk about the love of Jesus. And that's going to be that's going to be Love Day. We'll do that once a year. That's our. There is nothing wrong with that. In fact, that that would be great. That would be wonderful. Amen. I think a lot of good would come out of that. We've done the same with Christmas. Yeah, there's a lot of negatives attached to it, but if you come to my house you're not going to see a lot of that negative stuff you might see some and be like what in the world are you doing right but you're not going to see rum and eggnog you're not going to see the yule log you're not going to see i don't even know that christmas in past it was so revolved around commercialism and alcohol right none of that is a part of our christmas anymore we've held on to the good parts of the tradition and and we've moved on and 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 Honestly, this is the one time of year, really, that I even get to see most of my family. We're busy with the everything, you know, but we actually get an opportunity to live in front of our family. My wife and I were just talking about this. Um, somebody, they, they booked the family Christmas and they didn't let us know conveniently, right? So we're not going to be at the one side of the family. We might have moved stuff around, but it's too late. We've planned it. <clears throat> we are just talking about how that would have been a great opportunity for the family that thinks we're a bunch of weirdo cult members to see us live in front of them. Go there. We're not drinking. We're not smoking. We're not doing all the things we used to do. But we're we're balanced, good people. We have a, we have a great son. We're we're raising him right. We're doing the best we can. We're trying to love our family members. But hey, when the when the party really gets going, we just say good night. Have a good night, everybody. We're gonna go home now to bed at a reasonable time. That's the kind of testimony that people need to see of us. And if we just say no. Nope, I'm not celebrating it. Become like Jehovah's Witnesses. If anyone ever has been around Jehovah's Witnesses, you know that they're, they're, they're weird, they're recluse, they're strange, and they don't reach the world. Do you know they reach? They reach lonely people that just moved in. They grab a hold of them, suck them into the cult, and then they, they don't let them go. They ostracize them from their family. They have to use all these crazy mind control techniques to even get people to buy into their program because right. it's weird. There's nothing normal about it. What in the world were people, like, one example, they, they, would, they would stand up and go into the hall at school when O Canada was being played because they refused to celebrate a country above their God. It's garbage. I live in Canada. I'm happy that I have the freedoms that I do have. We could be in a lot worse places right now. Right. So stand for the anthem, you know, respectfully. Same thing with something like Christmas. Hey, there are redeemable qualities to it. And this is my opinion. This is my persuasion. I'm not going to beat you up if you believe differently. But everybody needs to be persuaded in their own mind. And I used to be contrary. But now I believe differently. I believe Christmas is a good holiday. And the best part about it is that you can reach other people. They're soft to the gospel. They're ready to hear about Jesus. They're ready to hear and to and to be in the same room. People even that won't want to talk to you most of the year will let you back into their living room just because it's Christmas. And now you get an opportunity to minister to people and to, and to preach the truth and to, and to be a shining light into a dark world that you too often don't have the opportunity to be a part of.